The views presented in this program are not meant to express the specific views of the Lafayette Bible Fellowship. You are listening to the Vigilance Radio Network. You are listening to Truth Time with Pastor Monty. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Thank you, Matt. You want answers? You can't handle the truth! The problem is having the right worldview and acting upon it. The worldview that gives men and women the truth of what is. Welcome to Truth Time with Pastor Monty, a show where two pastors from different generations talk about truth in today's culture. At the top of the show today, let's go ahead and spread this content by liking and sharing it and making sure that you're subscribed to our show. And for all of you on YouTube, hit the bell so you can be informed of all upcoming shows. The Truth Time with Pastor Monty broadcast is a part of the Lafayette Bible Fellowship's online podcast network of shows called the VRN. If you're interested in this ministry or our other shows, you can check us out at abfpdx.org, where you can access more resources, donate, and learn more about ABF and our local church in Portland, Oregon. And now that all of that is said, I'm Pastor Josh, the senior pastor over at ABF, and your co-host for this show, and this is Pastor Monty. Welcome to Truth Time. I am Pastor Monty, and I'm sitting here with Pastor Josh, and Hello. We're, we're going to be discussing, uh, you know, some various uh, various things here. But before we get to that, let's just take care of some administrative stuff. We'll touch on this again at the end of the uh, show. But um, but next week um, we will not be here. So I, uh, Pastor Josh may be in the area, but I won't be out of the area. Nope. Next week I will be in Southern Oregon. All right, so Pastor Josh in Southern Oregon. I'm in uh, Central Oregon, and so uh, you'll need to tune in the week after, and we'll pick things back up. With that being said, lots of exciting things to discuss this morning. Let's uh, take a look at uh, the book of Colossians, chapter 2 in the Christ Factor. Just the Here in Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul continue his discussion. He's doing more of an introduction in chapter 2 and talking about, um, uh, ta- uh, sharing a little bit about his feelings towards the church at Colossae. And while he is uh, doing a uh, um, really a deep dive into, into the current philosophy of the day, which is Nazism and how it's affecting the church, He's also kind of introducing himself as he, some may know him there, but not everybody is familiar with him. And so what he is doing is he's kind of introducing himself. So uh, starting in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let's hold off there for just a second. So even in his writings, when you read the uh, writings of the Apostle Paul, really a skilled writer, he's, uh, he's introducing himself, that's true, but what he's stating up front is that, you know, the intent of this, this letter that I'm writing to you is that uh, I want you to know how much I'm contending for you and how much I'm working on your behalf to help you uh, to understand these things that you're dealing with, that you might understand the, uh, the mystery of God and that you might understand uh, who Jesus Christ is uh, within uh, the whole scope of thing, uh, in whom all, uh, all 
all the treasures of, of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. So you might remember that uh, this, is, this is particular vernacular for those that are dealing with the issue of Gnosticism because their big thing was that um, only a set number of people um, had access uh, to wisdom uh, be through special knowledge. And the Apostle Paul is, is basically saying all of those things are wrapped up in Jesus Christ and it is available to all who are uh, disciples of Jesus Christ. Add anything? No? Yeah? All right, that's basically that's basically the framework. Um, it might be interesting to note also that Laodicea, we kind of have an idea of what Laodicea is going through because John writes about Laodicea. Well, Christ gives a message about Laodicea in Revelation right? where he talks about how the church is neither hot nor cold. Um, so that's something to, like that might give you a little bit of a background there. Right. So, uh, yeah. So uh, if you go to the book of Revelation, look at the letters to the churches in the introduction uh, in the first couple chapters of the book of John, Laodicea is mentioned, and normally it is the hot and cold thing, which which, w what the Spirit ha held against the church at Laodicea is that they were neither. They were kind of, meh. They were kind of ambivalent. Well, it's interesting. I mean, not to get too sidetracked, but if you do a study on Laodicea as a place, it's between a hot spring and, like, the ocean, I think. Okay. And so... It literally, the water at Laodicea was lukewarm. Yeah, geographically it was. It was lukewarm. Yeah. Like people didn't like the water at Laodicea because it was like not hot or cold. And so it's used by Christ in his revelation to John to discuss like that's, that's kind of who you are. Right. You need to, he, his admonition to them was you need to have some, some passion. Yeah. And, uh, and the Apostle Paul has already stated that he has lots of passion. He's contending for the church that the church might have a proper understanding of uh, who Jesus Christ is. Uh, verse 4, For I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So he's making clear in his message that he is for the church. This is not a letter reprimanding them, as it were. This is a church helping them to understand the dynamic of what's taking place with uh, Gnosticism in regard to the person of Jesus Christ. Well, I think it, yeah, I think that when you look at Revelation and the charge that is being brought against Laodicea, and then you look at what Paul is saying to that church. I think that there's um, an indication here that this is more admonishment than it is acceptance of, of who they are, right? Like, he wants that passion for them. He wants them to have, in his words, complete confidence um, that they already understand God's mysterious plan. And I think that there's that's interesting from the standpoint that uh, there's a lot of Christians these days who lean into the idea that God can't be known because we are finite creatures. And so because he can't be known, then there's no point in being passionate. There's no point in being bold. It's even like against, um, it goes against God in some sort of hubristic way to like, to speak boldly for him. And what Paul's saying is it's the opposite. God can be known. The revelation of God is Christ in history. And all of his mysteries are shown in that. And so there needs to be uh, real action and boldness in, uh, in the church. Well, the underlying message uh, of the gospel of Christ is that through the shed blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary, we as God's creation have access to God, a living God, a God that we can have a relationship with through Christ's shed blood. The false message, which was being preached by the, uh, 
by the Gnostics was that only a select few could have access to God, as they understood God to be, and that um, only those few had to have a, a special knowledge in order to be able to go there. Right. And so the overall message that the Apostle Paul is giving is that um, basically this Gnostic belief system is false and that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you can have that personal relationship with God, everybody, without special knowledge, through the work of Christ on the cross. And that's a powerful message. And that's a message which is still powerful today. Mm -hmm. uh, many have difficulty with it and reject it. But if you really think about the power of that, it is the gospel of Christ that transforms us today and helps us to be able to overcome uh, the human frailties uh, that come with uh, that come with being a uh, a creation which is separated uh, from our God through sin. Yeah. He says that even though he's absent in body, so he recognizes he's not there. I'm present with you in spirit, and delight to see how uh, disciplined you are. And affirm your faith in Christ is. So again, I really think that's a bit of a dig. Do, do I really you, do. You yeah. think it's sarcastic? Well, I don't think. I mean, yes, I think that there's a. It's hopefully sarcastic in the sense of we know what happens in Laodicea, right. like later on, right? Because this is written before John wrote Revelation. Yes. So we know that Laodicea continued to sort of become less and less potent, right? They became impotent as Christians to the point where Christ says something pretty violent, right? I will spit you out of my mouth. Right. And so I think that this is kind of a dig, like, you know, I'm coming back to, uh, or I'm coming there to visit you. And when I, when I get there, like, I'm excited to see these things, even yeah, though, I can see that. Sure. even though those things aren't necessarily present. Yeah, no, I can see that uh, kind of a admonishment, yeah. uh, you know, in a positive sense, this is... Well, there's this, something to learn from that as leaders. Yeah. This is where you should be, and we're going to encourage you to be there. Or maybe there is something to learn in the converse, because it didn't seem to do much. <laughs> with Didn't with have much impact? Yeah. Didn't, well, didn't at least at the impact. Church of Laodicea, it didn't have much impact. Now, th this letter was written specifically to the Colossians. I feel that Paul kind of... Yeah, yeah, you're right. I feel like Paul kind of does that... Um, a lot. Like, for instance, there's all these churches now, not the least of which is that mega church that is of, like, that's sort of super controversial. It's no longer a thing. Mars Hill, right? Yeah. There's right. all these churches that are named Mars Hill that are about the Areopagus and Paul's, like, debate with the philosophers and so on and so forth. But what people don't, f like, remember is that that was failed. Right, right. Like he went there and he failed to convince them. So then afterwards he says, I'm just going to preach Christ. Right. You find that in Corinthians. Right. And so like I feel like Paul kind of does that a lot where maybe he speaks a little softer than he should. And then, you know, crafts an argument later. Whereas like John, for instance, who is Christ's good buddy, is like going around calling people antichrist and sons of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> so... You th do you think that the Apostle Paul was a little more PC? Well, he says, I mean, I mean, he, I mean, obviously he doesn't pull punches, but and he's and he's a little sarcastic. But that being said, he says, quite frankly, that he's not a good speaker. Right, and and obviously we have no uh, we have no sound bites of him. Right. So we don't know for sure. Right. Uh, but, but but that being said, he's a, he's a great writer. He's a great writer. Anyway, yeah, he's a great writer. So uh, verse six. So then just as you receive uh, Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing uh, with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than Christ. So here's a blatant warning which he gives. He compliments them and says, you know, you have received these things, be, but then he says, be rooted 
and, and uh, built up in your faith in him, strengthened as you were taught. And, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the mission of the Apostle Paul to the local church, regardless of whether it's Colossae or the Romans or the Corinthians. or See, the, w- what the Apostle Paul did is that he would go to various areas and he would stay there for two or three years and he would teach the local church and then he would move on. And for those churches that he was not able to go to. So when we look at his letters, what we see is letters which are written to places where he has been or places where he has hoped to be. Right. Or places that uh, he has heard that they're having difficulty. Right. And so he's he's trying to admonish and direct them uh, to overcome that difficulty. But, But always... What we see with the writings of the Apostle Paul is that he is he is uh, dispensing rudimentary knowledge to a young church who is struggling to have a correct theology. Yeah, he's definitely laying groundwork for loving God with your mind. Yes, which he of course you know talks more about, uh, for example, in Corinthians. Uh, chapter 12 um, but but so you know he talks about the fact that their their faith needs to be built up and in that there need to be uh, you know overflowing in thankfulness but because they're sticking to what they've been taught because they're strengthened in their faith and firm they're not going to be swayed by deceptive arguments that are being made and clearly Nazism falls within that that uh, that area, right. deceptive arguments, and there see, uh, so that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. And here's the crux of then his letter to the church at Colossae, that they stand firm in what they've been taught, they stand firm in understanding the personhood of Jesus Christ, and that all wisdom and knowledge are hidden inside of him and that they are open to all who would come to him as his disciples and there's no special uh there's no special knowledge needed to do so i would say that this verse is probably one of the crux verses of uh, the whole book yeah yeah it definitely expounds on the the concept laid in in number one it's important like the the argument against the proto gnostic philosophies you know that would eventually evolve into like full blown if you can call it that christian gnosticism um the heresy of gnosticism started you know creating gnostic gospels and all that sort of stuff that came a little bit later right it's important to not underestimate the um, its effect and its effectiveness over time um, on the church because the stuff that Paul and really John are writing about are, um, it's so prevalent. It's so prevalent now with progressive Christianity and the universal Christ and all of these like ideas about who we are as Christians and who Jesus was. And specifically, it really does come down to the supremacy of Christ, both over the spiritual and over the physical. Exactly. Uh, and so there's a lot of that juxtaposing in these writings, especially in Colossians and in First and Second and Third John. Um, there's a lot of juxtaposing the physical with the with the spiritual and making sort of jabs at this idea of knowledge. You're going to see lots of uh, statements about n- knowledge and wisdom because those are the two uh, uh, knowledge, wisdom, and creation. There's right. a lot of links there because those are kind of the three things that Gnosticism kind of takes and owns. It makes creation the devil, it makes knowledge salvation, and it makes uh, wisdom the savior. Right. And so we're going to, um, when we get together in two weeks, we're going to continue our discussion of this because he now he lays the foundation and now he makes the bold statement in verse 9 of chapter 2 
in regard to uh, how everything is brought together in Jesus Christ. And so we'll pick that up and continue there um, next week, or uh, week after next. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go ahead and let's move on and uh, have a little talk about uh, relationships. So we've been talking about uh, relationship in regard to uh, the relationship that exists between husband and wife, and this being a a, uh, a, a, a central relationship for the body of Christ, for for everybody really, but 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 particularly in the body of Christ, we see this uh, as as uh, the pre, pre aside from the relationship that that we have with God. This is uh, the the premier relationship uh, that we normally find ourselves in uh, in in life, and there are we've talked a little bit about the background of of uh, the ideal. We've talked about some of the the difficulties that uh, can exist uh, because of the baggage that people bring uh, to this relationship, and now we want to talk just a little bit about some of the dynamics or things that can be helpful in um, how it is that you are able to adjust in this particular relationship uh, that you are dealing with uh, with a spouse. So one of the things that we talked about in particular, so last week just as a, as a foundational thing, one of the things we talked about was the importance of understanding that, that each individual within the relationship is an individual and, and is to be appreciated for, for who God created them to be. And there's this misconception, I, I believe anyway. I mean, I always, I always grew up and heard it was, it was a, uh, that was the way it was supposed to be. Is that you, you find somebody who is like you, mm. and that's the person you want to marry. Really? Yeah, because you know you have similar interests. You have similar interests. You have similar likes, similar dislikes. Convenience. And I, I get that that may make things a little bit easier at times. But dynamically, that's not, uh, I don't think that's the ideal. I think that, that what you want to do is marry somebody who has different likes than you, different strengths than you, different weaknesses than you, so that as you mature in your relationship, you will, uh, you will strengthen one another and your relationship will be, um, will be stronger. Now, that said, uh, that means you got a lot of work on your plate. Yeah, I think that that's probably the easier way to go to build dynamics. Uh, the truth is, is that your only qualification should really be, does this person drive me to be better before God? You know, like... And yeah, okay, okay, but let me play the advocate and say, how, how do you know that when you're just meeting sure. somebody? Sure. Well, th so that's, I mean, I, yeah, of course, you got you to gotta figure it out. And, and iron sharpening iron is, the, is an easy way to do that. But that being said, relationships, when you get into like a covenantal level relationship, you start to deal with the nuance of people. And w though we all seem the same in terms of uh, like I like watching this show, I like eating good food, so on and so forth, you know, and, yeah. you know, like that sort of thing. People are so nuanced that when you're living at the level of nuance in a relationship, y the differences are a great divide. Like it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's extreme, even if a person is uh, basically the same as you, like in general. So I, I mean, I think, I think if, you, if you live in the nuance of a relationship and really get to know a person, you're going to have no problem finding dynamics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, lo look at the... Um uh, let's. Uh, my wife and I have been married for forty-three plus years. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is a uh, is uh, <laughs> she's very clean. Uh huh. She likes things clean. She vacuums every day. I don't know day. what's being said she, here, but yeah. Yeah. So so, so she's uh, like anal with cleaning. Uh, we, uh, no, I wouldn't go that far, but she's definitely she wants things. But would you go anal? Would <laughs> that? <laughs> <laughs> would you <laughs> not a big fan of anal <laughs> would you say that uh, never mind i lost <laughs> the moment i'm sorry okay i took so <laughs> it i t just like anal i took it down a path it shouldn't have gone yeah okay so the, the but my my point is is that 
I'm not. So and I'm watching I'm, the co- the comments flood in right now. <laughs> <laughs> so so when I'm in the kitchen, right, and I'm cooking. Yes. You know, I I, I grew up in the restaurant industry where we had uh, we had mess cooks, and we had bus. Uh, you know, we had dishwashers. Right. And we had people to clean up after us. So my style of cooking is I'm 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 in my creative mode here. Right. And so you don't clean up I your got, own mess. No, I got pans all over, and I got I got stuff and everything. See, I think, I think sink. my wife, who I've been married to for about fifteen years now, would uh, think that you're the reason why I <laughs> why <laughs> like I have a hard time in the kitchen when I like I just dirty every possible dish. Well, then the other thing is, is so so then when I'm done, that creation is sitting there, mm-hmm. and it needs to be eaten, right? While it's still hot. Yes. And so when you <laughs> when you walk right, so you into gotta the, eat it. when you walk into the kitchen, you got a disaster in there, but who cares? Because sure. you gotta get that hot That's creation. That's not a priority. Down. That's right. Yeah. But but my wife on the other hand, she she goes crazy. She can't eat the meal unless No, she's gotta have all that stuff yeah. cleaned up. I got all this is out of order, this isn't right, this so <laughs> she's busy trying to clean things up. Right. It's it's not that, you know, it's not that we don't appreciate each other, but and I don't try to drive her nuts, but I know I do. Yeah, my wife is the same way. <laughs> so she those... like can't enjoy the food unless she's in a particular, uh, like nested. She needs to like nest into the food. Yeah, you yeah. know it's got to be like perfect, and I got to have the environment a certain way. And but that's that's a male woman distinction. Yeah. And that's but but that's the when you talk about uh, nuances that you have yeah. to live with, you know, uh, some people like their toilet paper facing a particular direction. Well, some, <laughs> there are people who like it, you know, top down, you know, versus bottom down. Oh yeah, there are people who like it top down, and then there's people who are wrong. <laughs> uh, the only thing that I can think of where that's not true is perhaps if you have cats. Because then they can pull Because they like it to roll it. Unroll the, yeah. But then, again, I think that squarely puts you in the wrong camp because why do you have cats? And why do you have that door open so they can get in your bathroom? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not good with cats. Uh, okay, so those are the some of the nuances we're talking about. So You know, cats have been worshipped as occultic figures in all sorts of cultures throughout, no, anyway. Yeah, almost almost <laughs> satanic in nature, for sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> so... So Satan um, prowls like a roaring. Okay. So how do you how do you, how do you uh, how do you deal with some of those things? Well, one way to do it is by learning communication skills that will help you to be able to overcome some of these things. So what typically happens is that when people when people are <laughs> in these situations and they haven't learned how to work things through, they send tons of what I call you messages. Okay. Where, you know, you're just a slob. <laughs> I call them ad hominem. Uh, yeah, you, yes, you like to use the word ad hominem attacks. I like to use um, proper. For those, <laughs> for, those of, for those of you who are not, uh, who are, uh, uh, are from the South, he's not talking ad hominy. Right. He's. <laughs> With, wow. With, uh, We're not talking about chickpeas over with, here. Right, with grits or, or uh, you know, or um, bacon, uh, onions and bacon. Yeah, okay. So he's not talking <laughs> about hominy. <laughs> and and the ad hominem attack is where you attack the individual and not the issue. Right. In, in, uh, with that, and that word, that's, ad hominem is just fancy Latin for to the person, attacking the person. Attacking the person instead of the David fell down. Oh, 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 oh okay. <laughs> there you go. Anyway. In, instead of the uh, the issue that's involved. Right. And the issue is what is important. Uh, we'll just get that motorcycle later. Uh, you got it. <laughs> okay. That is going to fall down again. Yeah, it is. So, so the, the issue is what, what's important. Wow. Rather than the... Uh, you know, rather than attacking the individual. Right. Now, because I'm not as sophisticated as my son, I okay. I, t- <laughs> I tend to just uh, say it in uh, in street language, which is, you you message. The You're t- sloppy. The term that we use nowadays is privileged. 
Yeah. You're privileged? Yeah, you're not as privileged as I because you grew up on the streets. Yes. However, you are white, so by nature, you are more privileged than I. However, I am both white and Filipino, and I'm as privileged as I am not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I am not. Sorry, I'm feeling saucy today. I yeah, think. I am not. However, um, I, I definitely speak white trailer trash. There you go. And, and uh, so calling people names like or saying that you're this or you're that is counterproductive to what it is you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So you have, if you have an issue, I mean, one of the reasons why it's an issue is because you're driving each other, <laughs> you're driving each other nuts. And so there are, so what you have to do is you have to come to an agreement, a mechanism, uh, as it were, put in a place a mechanism so that you be sensitive to the person that you're in a relationship with. Because you really don't want to, uh, you shouldn't want to push each other's buttons. Right. You know, because that, that really is, it's not productive. It doesn't lead anywhere. Yeah. Um, it's not, it, that's you, not the reason why you got into a relationship. Right, right. So, so um, I do not like uh, you messages. You're this, you're that. I prefer I messages, which, mm -hmm. which basically is, is uh, I'm the one that has the issue and I see that it offends you or you're having difficulty with it and uh, let's, let's try let's, <laughs> you have what? You got that difficulty. <laughs> I it, had trouble this getting is, that out. This is quite the episode. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I want to, you know, uh, facilitate how it is that we can uh, overcome this. Yeah. Or, or at least lessen the impact. So when we uh, have those types of discussions in my house, um, I don't... Um, I don't say to my wife things like, you know, you're a clean freak. Because she's not a freak. and So you only think it then? <laughs> I, I try to have righteous and pure thoughts at all time, I think, being a man of God. Yes, I think, <laughs> I think the messaging has to come from a place of heart, right? So it, it really goes back to Paul's teaching about spiritual gifts and you can take and apply that beyond just the spiritual gifts right and you look at how god has gifted the unit of of uh your covenant relationship whether it be your marriage or your with your children or whatever and then looking at how god wants those things to work together and so he your whole purpose in connecting in a covenant way to those things is because you have hope in what he gave and specifically that he is the sustainer of those things and he has a reason for those things existing. And so when, you, when you've when you got somebody in your life that you've made this covenant commitment to and you come across, hopefully just a nuance, but you come across the nuance of something that you don't like, at that point it's your responsibility to adopt the mentality that God knows better and that he put it in your life so that you could be better. And so when you... So that's why we don't say things that are ad hominem where, you know, we diminish the value of a person by saying you're just a this or you're or you're only this or I wish you, you weren't such a this or whatever. Right. Because right. we're not recognizing God's providence in the relationship or God's sovereignty in the relationship. And so if you come in from a heart perspective that I truly want to appreciate you uh or even i truly need to appreciate you then you're just not going to say those things right uh, but it but it takes practice uh, sure and because that's not how our culture functions and and the influence is always there and so you know josh pastor josh and i both talked about the fact that marriages work yeah. And, and you've got all these factors that go on that you experience and that you see in the world that surrounds you. And uh, it's, it's work to learn how to overcome those things. So, um, well, and, and our culture also, our culture tends to um, diminish the negative effect of 
commentary on a person, you know? It's like, it's it's kind of like we're taught in grade school and high school and so on and so forth that, like, the best way to relate to somebody is to talk trash to them. Yeah, yeah. You know? You're just a this, you're just a that. And it's like, but it's okay. The person knows that I love them. Well, I mean, really what happens for most people is they go home at the end of the day feeling bad about themselves on some level. Yeah. They dismiss it. Be, they perform a cost value analysis. Right. They dismiss it, um, you know, because they're getting uh, friendship during the day or they're getting things or they're being not lonely or whatever. But when they go home at night and they close that door, it's, you know, these things take a toll on you. Well, what happens if you do that in a covenant relationship where when you go home at night, you're still with the person yeah. who's, <laughs> who's calling you these things and who's diminishing your value as an image bearer of God? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very, very damaging to the relationship. Uh, one more uh, thing uh, before we close this section today. Let's talk about uh, um, uh, never and always. And and those types of uh, those types of describers in our language, um, people, you you hear it a lot, where people will say, "Well, you always do this," so you've got a behavior that is that uh, you know is annoying your spouse, and and uh, you know she might say to you or he might say to you, you know, you you always do this, or. It's something that you would wish they would do, but they don't do. Sure. And you would say, you never. And we try to eliminate uh, in, in, uh, in our discussion between my wife and I, uh, those, particularly those two describers, because nothing is ever always. Now, it may be a lot. Sure. But it's not always. And nothing is ever never. Um, it may not happen a lot, but but the, the the for me the term never and always preclude any ability to uh, to change mm. and to and to make adjustments uh, for how somebody does something, so that when you when you're thinking in the past, you know a lot of times what will happen is the couples will will bring up something that they dislike. And because it hasn't been addressed, and they will say, "Well, you never do this." It's it's like it 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 dirties the issue that you're trying to address, sure, and makes it difficult to discuss. There's this wonderful uh, song that uh, that Garth Brooks does. Um, I mean, it can't be with that wonderful. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, uh, we buried the hatchet, but we left the handle sticking out. Okay. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. It's, it's a great song. Pull it up and, and uh, listen to it. Uh, um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I so, never. Yeah, you know, you, you, well, that, that precludes your ability to, <laughs> for change, Josh. Um, so, yes. So, we try to eliminate that type of verbiage because I think it's kind of reductive. I think it's okay, personally. I think, uh, but your point, I, the point that you're making, I, I agree with. I, for me, it's about speaking truthfully, right? And yes. speaking honestly. And so the question is, are you lying? And I think a lot of times people are willing to lie out of what you're talking about, which is hyperbole, right? Like they speak, they say never and always about these things. That is really a lie. Sometimes there is never, you know? Sometimes my husband never brings me flowers sometimes that's it's a justified statement to say this has never happened or it's a justified enough statement to say this happens so little that it is as if never but but uh, if you but if you actually said that you would have been then qualifying your never yeah but and it would be okay but that's language right like language at least in english there's colloquial room for us to speak in generalizations. The question is, are you lying? Yeah, are, right? you, are you truthful in your generalizations? Are, yeah, exactly. Are you, are you bearing false witness? Are you testifying against your husband um, where you're trying to convict him of something, or your wife, whatever, where you're trying to convict them of something? And there's a tangibility issue there, like flowers. That's a tangible issue, right? But when you start talking about 
you never like this. Well, now you're dealing with a heart issue. That's really hard to that's really hard to testify truthfully about another person's position and intent, yeah. Yeah, because they cuz maybe they have always or maybe they always are thinking about you, but they never show it to you in the way that you understand for whatever reason. And so really that's a miscommunication. Which is why Pastor Monty's saying, like, it's just easier to take that out of your language. And I agree, it's just easier. Let's let's make sure that the reason we do that is so that we can be more truthful. Because there are gonna be times where never is true. Okay. I uh, I'll I'll allow for that. Thank you. Not always, but <laughs> <laughs> but there it was. But but this, but this time, okay. We got a uh, smile from producer Jasmine. <laughs> let's uh, let's cl- go ahead and close this section, and we'll pick it up in two weeks and uh, talk a little bit more about communication. Let's talk about what's going on in the world today. Great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> red alert is the right sound. Um, okay. Is that, is that an original Star Trek sound? Is that red alert sound? You've been uh, alive since the beginning of television. <laughs> is that where? <laughs> wow. Is that, uh, it's true, right? It's the sound that a submarine makes. That's a submarine sound? Yeah. When you, that's the, it's the, but you it's were on the a submarine, dive signal. But you were on a submarine in what, the 1970s? Yeah. Now, I just want to point out to you that the submarine that you were on is 20 years removed. Well, at least 10 years removed from the original Star Trek. And the Navy and the military has been known to steal things from the original Star Trek. Okay, Josh. The, <laughs> Na- the Navy <laughs> did not steal this <laughs> from Star Trek. Someone investigate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, that's a crazy assertion. <laughs> I mean, come on. The space shuttle is named Enterprise because it's based on Star Trek. Okay. We're, we're going to talk. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're, we're not going to talk today about uh, Star Trek, about Putin. And about okay. the uh, about the um, ridiculousness of the uh, what's going on over in Europe at this point, I want to uh, uh, talk something which is a little closer to home. That is that uh, Jesse Smollett got uh, uh, sentenced okay. a couple of days ago, and it was fascinating to watch his reaction to uh, being sentenced. So um, he was found guilty on the charges that were leveled against him of fabricating a, a hate uh, a hate crime, mm-hmm. and um, and he was uh, tried and found guilty. These are felony charges, and so the sentencing was that uh, he was to spend 150 days in lockup in Cook County in lockup um, at the county jail. He was charged $120 to pay $120,000. I was going to say, that's... To be paid to uh, the city of uh, Chicago Uh uh, for uh, For restitution. For the time they spent. For the time they Mm -hmm. spent uh, chasing all of the nonsense. And then he was charged a $25,000 fine for filing a false police report. Hmm. Now, that's the the charges that were... That seems pretty tame. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so basically, 150 days. That's uh, that's a little shy of. Um, of it's about five months. Okay. So he's gonna spend five months, but his reaction to that. First of all, he he and his family were uh, during the time where you get to speak. You know, mm-hmm. his family was uh, argumentative. First of all, was his sister a part of that journey, Journey Smollett? I, I. Mostly, I remember seeing his uh, his twin, his twin, and his parents. Okay, I was just wondering because Journey is still very much in the the spotlight. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm I think she's like on shows and stuff. She plays um, Black Canary in the DCEU, and yeah. Anyway, I don't remember seeing that much of her or her her reaction, but the family was very much uh, opposed to the fact that he was found guilty. Yeah, and um, and just before, uh, so he was sentenced, and as he was being led out of the courtroom, he got up and he was uh, screaming at the top of his lungs, 
that he was not suicidal. Interesting. In in trying to set a new narrative, as he walked out of the courtroom, he's screaming, "I am not suicidal, and um, I am not guilty. If I was guilty, I would have said so." Uh, and, Interesting. And and so, uh, basically, what he's doing is he's saying that uh, he wants to make sure that either he's setting the stage one or two ways. That my take on it is that uh, either he's setting the stage uh, that uh, he will either uh, uh, be uh, killed uh, and or that uh, somebody will do a Jeffrey Epstein on him. And, and uh, Well, it might be true. I mean, he really set back the... He really set back the... Uh, Propaganda or whatever for for the well, various said, causes that I, he's connected to. I think that he's trying to establish a new narrative. Could be. I that sounds to me like somebody who has some real mental health issues. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Very, very narcissistic. He refused to accept the guilt. I mean, some of the things that were brought forward. Uh, you know, the the if you followed this trial at all. The the police were not looking at this on a whim. They had emails. Yeah, this guy he crafted it. Yeah, this not only did he craft it, but he 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 signed a check to pay these two that supposedly were the ones that be. He signed from his personal checking account a check to pay them. Yeah, I mean, th this is not somebody that uh, the elevator is uh, rising fully to the top, or he's not a very good criminal, <laughs> if that's the case. Uh, he wanted it to be believable, but it was not believable, and he's terribly upset about that. So I just thought it was interesting that he showed no, no remorse. He was trying to paint this narrative as he was walking out of the courtroom, and uh, now they're saying, uh, the latest is that they're saying that that uh, the, the county has uh, got him in confinement and trying to do an evaluation as to whether he's mentally stable or not. That's what's going on. So, I mean, my take on it, you know, first of all, the guy is terribly narcissistic. Presented. Yeah, I don't know that that's specific to our world, but yes. Well, as believers, we need to be careful that we don't buy into that that type of thing. Right. Um, one of the things that, that really took me back, now we're going back several years, but one of the things that really took me back was when uh, the incident that started the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement and all of that, where the guy was... Uh, was uh, supposedly shot in the back by by the uh, by the police officer that he was uh, doing mm -hmm. in the car there. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. That uh, I, I can't remember his name. Trayvon. Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there were three separate investigations by both local and by feds to determine. <laughs> whether this incident as it was being portrayed by the black community as well as those around was truthful or not. And remember that, that multiple entities uh, ran to judgment against this police officer. And of all the investigations, what, what came to find out is that the reason why this guy was shot was because he was attacking the police officer, and in fact was trying to take his gun and shoot him. And out of all of the, out of all of the uh, um, issues that came out out of this, only one black commentator came back and said, "You know what? I I was wrong." Hmm. And that's not what happened. But Black Lives Matter and all of these other individuals. Uh, continued to present a false narrative uh, which ran contrary to the truth of what actually happened. And that's the society that we live in, and, that, and so as believers, we need to be very careful 
that we that we don't rush to judgment and don't, that we don't buy into the multiple uh, the multiplicity of false narratives that exist today uh, of what's happening around us. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that that's specific to race, but it's definitely present. Um, have you seen the, maybe we talked about it before, but the Saturday Night Live skit about COVID? No, I don't. Yeah, I haven't. I stopped watching Saturday, uh, SNL a long time ago. Yeah, they there was a COVID skit that they did not too long, like two weeks ago, I think that like blew up on the internet or whatever but it's they're at a dinner party and they're talking about something or other and then it it, the, it moves to covid and then they start talking about how like sheepishly somebody would be like um you know vaccines don't work and then everybody would be like <gasps> you know face masks don't work <sighs> you know uh and then, but they would like kind of sheepishly. Somebody would be like, "Well, you know, it's kind of kind of weird how like the science like seems to change." And then people would be like, "Be careful," you know. And it's it's actually really really funny. Um, but yeah, like we we rush we rush into making like snap judgments about things because we think that so many things are life and death. Um, but really they require a lot more discernment and wisdom. And if you wait things out, then it's not, it's not as bad oftentimes as you think it is. Um, yeah. 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 Um, last night I was watching an interview with, uh, with Senator Rand Paul, who's a doctor and he and Dr. Fauci always go at it. Mm -hmm. And, um, he is introducing legislation into this today in fact or tomorrow he's introducing legislation to eliminate the uh the position that dr fauci holds um and and put him out of the the uh his position for good and one of the things he talked about was the fact that which it was he he is the the only person that i have heard of all the commentators uh in regard to the issue of we follow the science to say that when you take steps to shut down debate in yeah. regard to w whether something is truth or not, then you are, um, you are not following the science. And then he went on to describe the Aristotelian method for discovering what is true and what is not. Right. Which requires hypothesis and then, uh, and then testing that to see whether uh it results in uh, a form of truth or not but he's the only person i've heard that, oh i've heard lots of people that understand the i mean at a, a really high level like high a senator or like a well-known yeah yeah he's the only person i've heard who actually articulated the fact that the 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 whole presentation of we're going to follow the science uh was uh, a sham yeah well, I think that it was a useful catchphrase that then got sloppily applied to lots of things. That's kind of where it goes to. It, 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 science has become very much a euphemism for just another form of religion. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, for, for many, most definitely. But it, by very nature, like science is very much a form of religion in the, in the sense that Science doesn't really conclude anything. It just presents, you know, it just presents um, interpreta inter interpretation. <laughs> interpretation, yes, interpretation. interpretation of data. And that interpretation can change over time. It's actually unscientific to conclude that it can't. Yeah, so, so um, but basically speaking, if you follow the Aristotelian method of coming to truth, um, it is a truth then for you is always a moving target. Yeah. And because of the nature of, of his approach, that's the reason why uh, Plato rejected uh, Aristotle's uh, position. Yeah. So that being said, let's, let's close out uh, our discussion there of what's happening today with Jesse Slamolet. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is I think we're all having strokes on the yeah. <laughs> on the show today. And let's talk about what's up with that. What's up with that? What's up with that? 
Well, you know, in North Carolina, there's a woman that's been battling the state of North Carolina for some time now because she wanted to have her license plate read fart. Okay. <laughs> and was it spelled F-A-R-T? Yes, or? it was. Yes, okay. it was. And she wanted that license plate on her truck. Okay. <laughs> so. I'm kind of I'm kind of obsessed with the alternate F sound that because everybody uses F or P H, oh, right? P-H, P-H, but the one that nobody ever thinks about. You want to take a guess? No. <laughs> no. No, I don't. Is G H. Okay. Like, think about enough. Is that pronounced F? Yeah, enough. Enough, okay. G-H, right? Like, yeah. think about that. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah. So, like, you might theory, be able to get away with that. Yeah, G H A R T. That would spell fart. Right. Anyway. A- at least it would make people scratch their head. If, yeah. <laughs> if they were or in that you. case, because it's the beginning of something that would it be a hard sound with the H being silent. Gart. I don't know. I don't know. Well, this t- <laughs> so the state of North Carolina said, no, we're not allowing that. Um, however, they still issued her the license plate. Okay. And then they said to her, we're not going to allow this to be on your vehicle. But How- we're still going to make you pay. However, we gave you, the <laughs> we gave you the license plate, and you can do whatever you want with it, except put it on your vehicle. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, again, that's why. It's How can it? But a license plate is supposed to license a vehicle. Yeah, I know. Like, so what are they licensing? I don't know. That's what's up with that. That is weird. <laughs> okay. Huh. So for those of you who are looking for colorful things to put on your license plates, Pastor Josh has given you a couple of ideas there. Yeah. Spell fart with a G-H. I mean, well, even, what if you, even if you did P-H... A-R-T. I feel like people that, would know that they one. Might, that, they might get that one. That one I think they would know. But if you spelt it like G-H-E-A-R-T, <laughs> right? Yeah, that'd be... It'd be yeah, like Gahart. That'd be a scratcher, for, a head scratcher for some people. Right, Gahart, but actually it's fart. Uh, for people like... This is, this is for you, Josh. Okay. Um, you know, for people that... Uh, All right, let's hear it. The... For people that are into comic book characters, oh, okay, that's acceptable. Yeah, there's a <laughs> there's a kid uh, in India. I say a kid because he's only seven years old. Okay, there's a kid in India that bo- broke the Guinness World Book of Records, naming sixty DC comic characters in less than a minute. That seems easy. Not impressed. No, you don't really. hold the Guinness Book of World Records. That's true. I don't hold the Guinness Book of World Records for anything trivial. I'm just saying. Or significant either. <laughs> but but that being said, that doesn't seem hard. I feel like I could get real close. And if I was practiced, then even closer. That's one name per second. Yeah? Okay. But a second is a long time when you're just using syllables, right? <laughs> so you stick you stick to the small syllables, like two sil- like Robin. There, there you go. You know. But I feel like in the Batman family alone, Batman, Nightwing, Huntress, Robin, Oracle, Batgirl, Batgirl one, Batgirl two, Batgirl three, Batgirl four, Clayface, Mister Freeze. I mean, you, you're already at thirty seconds. You got to speed it up. You're not going to get sixty seconds. And do you count? And are you counting like the different Robins by, you know, Robin one, Robin two, Robin three, Robin four? Are I'm not counting, counting the. I don't know. The, that seems the, easy. The uh, guy. The Justice <laughs> League has the ju- the Justice League alone in its basic members has seven members. That's, I just, that's one sixth almost of a. I just, re- just I just reported, but for those of you out there who seems uh, real easy, producer Jasmine, what do you think? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay, she's being non-committal. Yeah, you guys are <laughs> bunch of wimps. Okay, what? <laughs> so I was very specific. I I believe that that is something easily broken. Somebody needs to contact the Guinness Book of World Records, and Josh says he's willing to challenge that. I did not say that. <laughs> okay, so here's my last one. Okay. Uh, U.S. Customs, Border Patrol. Uh, and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, stopped. They seized 
um, six containers of, uh, of blood-sucking leeches that were being shipped in from Bulgaria into the United States. Six containers. Six like containers. Le- 300 leeches. So each they weren't or? large containers. But oh, okay. Like I'm thinking like... No, a shipping container? Yeah, like a shipping container of like six of them full of leeches. That's disgusting. Yeah, why, why, even 300 leeches are disgusting. Yeah. Why, uh, these, but these are, these are specifically forbidden leeches that somebody had uh, tried to get in uh, from Bulgaria into why? the United States. Why? I don't know. I just have to say, what's up with that? I got to tell you that leeches always remind me of tortellini. <laughs> <laughs> like, just think about it. If tortellini, <laughs> if tortellini had a mouth, that w- that's what a leech would be. Wow. I mean, yeah. I know leeches look more like slugs. Yep, not a big fan of leeches. No. All right, that's all I got for today. We are out of time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Then I guess we're <laughs> I guess we're out of time. Um, let us. You took up almost two minutes trying to figure f- your DC comic thing. For the record, <laughs> I am very confident, especially if you were to turn it into like a song. Like you know, you know what I'm talking about. You have you ever heard the song about the countries? Oh, that's a that's a great way to, to yeah, learn things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I will always remember Animaniacs. The very first episode of Animaniacs started with a song by Yakko, which is like one of the brothers, the, the Warner Brothers. And it goes, United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru. Yeah. You know? And it's like he's going down the whole like list of countries in the world. And I, like, I imagine that you could do something like that. Or the yeah. 50 Nifty United States by Ray Charles. Well, here's the thing. You know, if... Now you guys know how to push Pastor Josh's button. Mm-hmm. Um, challenge him whether he really can do sixty characters in a minute or not. Uh, again, I'm sure he, that if he's he's positive that he can do it. Oh, I was really clear that if practiced and I felt like that was a need, then I would do it. Let me just say, in all honesty, I have my doubts. Wow. Well, you heard it here, Pastor Monty uh, doubts things. <laughs> so. <coughs> on that note, if you're someone who's seeking answers <laughs> or you want to know more, this has been a real interesting episode talking about anal and leeches and <laughs> all sorts. Of <laughs> anyway, if you're someone who's seeking answers or you want to know more about your faith, if you're new to Jesus Christ of the Bible, we'd like to help you. So check out our website at abfpdx.org. Uh, remember that we're open to questions. Um, let's close it out. This is show is a part of the Vigilance Radio Network, which is a part of ABF's Project Vigilance, where we provide helpful and interesting resources for the church local and at large. If you want to be a part of that, you can always get access on our Facebook page um, to all of our content, including our church services, Culture and Sanity, Nightlight Radio. Um, There's a bunch of things there. If you've enjoyed us, you can consider supporting us uh, it doesn't cost anything to you, but it does cost stuff to us. <laughs> so uh, you can help us that way. Um, if not, it just helps us to remember to like and subscribe. So take a second to do that. Um, remember, you can stay up to date on our content whenever we share it, which will be in two weeks, but generally is shared every week on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. We'll see you then. I'm Pastor Josh, your co-host and the senior pastor over here at ABF. This has been Pastor Monty. The views presented in this program are not meant to express the specific views of the Lafayette Bible Fellowship. You are listening to the Vigilance Radio.